5710 World Polio Day Celebration. Blanche Parks, District Governor, District 5710. I'd like to thank you all for coming. Can we all say the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would like to call upon Kathleen Marker, Rotarian and YWCA of Topeka, uh, CEO, to provide us with the invocation. Good afternoon. Um, Blanche asked me to say a few words about why I was willing to do this and why this is important to me. So my mother was a Holocaust survivor and she was um, a war bride uh, married to an American Marine. And um, my father, after uh, his military service, was a firefighter in Kansas City. And shortly after they um, got settled in Kansas City, my, both of my parents contracted polio. And so my father had a very mild case of the virus and um, didn't have any sustaining um, things that, that he had to carry with him. But however, my mother uh, was in an iron lung shortly after I was born. And when I was five months old, she was released from the hospital. Thankfully, we had family that was there to support my parents, um, but it was something that my mother lived with for her entire life. So um, when some years ago, when I was asked by my employer to join a civic organization, I looked at the Optimus Club, I looked at the Kiwanis, I looked at Rotary, and I knew that Rotary is where my heart was because of the Polio Plus campaign. So, I'm very happy to be here today. So, if you would bow your heads. Creator and sustainer of all that is or will ever be, accept our thanks for this day and all its blessings. Guide us in our service. Keep us well so we can serve. And bless those people around the world who are touched by our works so that they too can have the joy of a fulfilling life full of good health. Help us to dedicate the world, educate the world, on the importance of eradicating this preventable disease. We ask for continued support to help medical personnel rid the world of polio. Give them wisdom and break down the barriers for completely eradicating this disease. And finally, we ask you to guide those who, as our government leaders, make their daily decisions that affect us, so that their efforts, whether international or local, shall be motivated by the same great rule of charity and goodwill. Amen. Please be seated. celebrate uh, this Rotary World, World, World Polio Day with our Kansas District 5710. Rotarians worldwide will be celebrating World Polio Day with, and by the way, this event is being live streamed, and uh, this entire day um, will be uh, uh, packed with World, 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 World Polio Day activities. Uh, culminating this evening at 5.30, uh, which there will be a major event in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, that will be live streamed, and that will feature Bill and Melinda Gates. So I want to mention that this is a live stream day. It's fun, going to be a fun day. Um, this event is uh, uh, currently uh, being, being uh, live streamed on our District 5017 YouTube channel. And so there are instructions on that on, on uh, how to get into the channel. Uh, worldwide, uh, this day will culminate again with the live streaming uh, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And now let's introduce uh, some of our exciting Rotarians who are here as visitors. And so uh, in, uh, this event could not have been possible without a legislative sponsor. So I want to say thank you so much to Rotarian and legislator, Brenda Dietrich. Uh, can we give her all a big hand? And now I'd like to call upon uh, uh, legislator, Brenda
Brenda Dietrich to provide us with uh, introductions of any of our uh, Shawnee County delegation. Thank you very much, Blanche. I've been a Rotarian for many, many years. I'm a member of the Topeka South Rotary Club, and we have some officials here from that club that will be introduced later. But it's my pleasure to introduce to you two individuals who are part of our Shawnee County delegation, and I'm sure many of you know quite well. We have Senator Vicki Schmidt with us today.
Thank you very much, Blanche. That was uh, very nice. Uh, and thank all of you who are here today to help us in Poland. Um, as Rotarians from across Kansas gather here today in celebration of World Polar Day, it's fitting that you are joining 1.2 million Rotarians around the world. We're pausing to look back and be proud of the amazing progress that has been made toward Rotary International's goal of complete eradication of polio. When Dr. Albert Sagan uh, was the keynote speaker at the Rotary International Convention in Kansas City in 1985, Poly Plus had uh, been thinking a lot about vaccinations. They'd already been successful in the Philippines and talked about it some. And what Sagan said was, stop talking about it. Do it. And guess what? Poly Plus was then created, and what a difference it has made. Then in conjunction with the World Health Organization, uh, UNICEF, the Center for Disease Control, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative was created in 1988. Since then, two and a half billion children have been vaccinated in 211 countries. Amazing accomplishment. This 30-year-long effort to deliver polio vaccine to every child has reduced the number of cases annually from 350,000 a year. Think about that. That's equivalent to a child having polio every two minutes. Well, now there are only two, there are only 20 cases so far this year in three countries that are not yet certified as polio free. That's Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nigeria. Unfortunately, the news last week of an additional case in Afghanistan certainly made it clear that we must remain committed to the goal of polio eradication. In order to ensure that polio is limited in those last three countries, and it never returns globally to any other country, the continued support of Polio Plus is needed to help train volunteers, monitor the environmental detection of the wild polio virus out in the environment, and to vaccinate every child in every country in the world for at least three years after the last wild case is detected. Now there's a bunch of compelling, compelling reasons why we have to achieve this goal. And I'm gonna give you the top five reasons that I can think of that I've talked to other polio uh, plus advocates about. First of all, eradication is gonna improve the lives of lots of people. So far, at least 17 and a half million people are walking around today who otherwise would have been paralyzed. That's an amazing statistic. Secondly, we, it's an investment in the future. Without eradication, in 10 years, it's possible as many as 200,000 children could be getting polio again. A polio-free world is therefore a much safer world for children. Third thing I'd like to mention, it will actually improve child health all around the world. Surveillance networks that have been built up in vaccination campaigns to eradicate polio will enable efficient and timely monitoring and addressing other children's health issues. Eventually, the polio protection infrastructure is transitioned to routine immunization efforts for other children's diseases like measles and things like that. The fourth thing would be to save some money. A polio-free world will actually save the global total economy at somewhere around 40 to 50 billion years over the next 20 years. Again, another amazing statistic. And finally, probably one of the most important things when you think about it, eradication would be one of the history's great public health achievements. It would be only the second time our people have eliminated a human disease. Remember, smallpox is gone. So as you are Rotarians and neighbors and friends, as you promote the Polio Plus message with your fellow Rotarians and your friends and neighbors and your communities, there's, there's just some things you can kind of tell them that will make them interested in helping eradicate polio. There's some five facts that you might share with you. Um, ice cream factories in Syria are helping by freezing the ice packs that health workers use to keep the polio vaccine cold during the immunization programs because there was an uptick in the number of cases, what we call vaccine, uh, they're called, sorry, 
circulating vaccine uh, derived polio viruses. What can happen when you get the oral vaccine? You can get a few cases, a very tiny number, can still get the viruses. There's another thing you might know about, might not know about, but you may recognize some of these names. Um, celebrities you've heard of, or may not have heard of, uh, have become the ambassadors in our fight to end the disease. They sponsored fundraisers, they participated in national immunization uh, days all around the world. For example, they include golfing great Jack Nicholas, uh, John Cena, if you're interested in uh, wrestling, uh, recording artist Sidney Marley, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, world renowned violinist and polio survivor Itzhak Perlman, uh, anthropologist Jane Goodall, to mention just a few, but best of all, our matching grant partner Bill Gates. The third thing you might not know about is how vaccinators get the vaccine to the kids. Health workers and rotary volunteers who climb mountains and cross deserts and sail the remote islands often risking their own lives to vaccinate children against this disease. They've used an amazing assortment of means of transportation. Polio Plus has provided, if you can believe it, over 1,500 motor bikes. We actually own 6,700 trucks and off-road vehicles and 17 boats. Vaccinators can even travel on the backs of elephants, camels, camels and donkeys just to get to the kids. So they get around. In Pakistan this last year, the polio program emphasized something the women in the audience are going to appreciate. What they did, they hired the local female vaccinators and monitors. Of more than 21,000 vaccinators working in Pakistan last year, 83% were women, and they achieved the highest immunization coverage rates in that country's history, which has resulted in holding the number of cases in Pakistan to current year down to only four cases with a very high probability that they're reaching zero next year, making this leaving us with only two countries covered. Uh, there's another thing you might not know about, and it's estimated by the Centers for Disease Control that there may be as many as 250,000 polio survivors living in the United States today, suffering the symptoms of what's called post-polio syndrome, syndrome, or PPS. In fact, while the last documented case of polio originally in the U.S. occurred in 1979, there are still three survivors living today who still have to use the iron lung in order to be able to sleep at night. One of whom actually lives in Kansas City. Throughout the Midwest, there are many well-organized post-polio support groups that meet regularly to share experiences and the best available advice about dealing with the latent effects of polio. Marianne and I both belong that group and one of our visitors. Lewis is here also a member of that group that we meet every year in Branson. Sometimes we're asked, what Rotary's rule with respect to polio being after the eradication is achieved, and how we can support the tens of thousands of children around the world who had polio before they had been reached with vaccines. Well, two important activities have been identified by Rotary International. Beginning now with Rotary's help, with the formation of a new initiative under what would be called RotaryPolioSurvivors.org, First, there will be an establishment of what we call polio survivors and associate associations and programs. They'll support the remaining efforts to achieving that eradication and initiate the community-based rehabilitation centers to help and identify and support survivors around the world and actually collect the personal stories of polio survivors to preserve their history, two of which you will hear later today. They'll connect with organizations all around the world who are assisting polio survivors. The second thing that Rotary Polio Survivors will be doing is underwrite the creation of these community-based rehabilitation centers. They'll be establishing locations where disabled people can have access to the services that they need. Their goal will be to ensure people with disabilities realize what their rights are, to lead lives with dignity, to obtain assistance with disability issues, and if necessary, to provide surgical solutions and adaptive devices for polio survivors worldwide. Since 1985, Rotary Clubs worldwide, have, including the Gates Matching Funds, have donated over $1.7 billion to Polio Plus. Amazing number. And with the Gates Matching Challenge continued two more years, 
Rotary itself has the potential to reach an additional $450 million for Polio Plus. In addition to the funds that are contributed and donated by Rotary with that match, a program of Rotary advocacy going out and talking to countries all around the world has resulted in an illicit pledges from many of these other countries to the Global Polio Eradication Initiative of Proteolics and other billion dollars. Now, you, that's a lot of money that's coming along, so maybe you might wonder, what are some of the things that donations can do? Well, let's just take the Rotary contribution, for example. As you said, if you give $100, what happens? Well, first of all, the gates of that foundation has it, and suddenly it becomes $300. Well, what can $300 under this program buy? Well, an example, they would purchase 600 of the vests that the women and vaccinators go out so that they can be recognized that they're safe and protected by their administering the vaccines. Or another choice might be to buy 300 of the vaccine carriers that protect and keep that vaccine safe. But more interesting enough, we pay for 2,400 of the little purple markers we put on every child's pinky to know that they've had that vaccine. So with all of the help that we've had, I just want to take this opportunity to honor and send a sincere thank you to the Rotary Clubs of Kansas, for holding many Polio Plus fundraising events, over the, especially over the last year, which we combined with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation gift, actually did approach a half a million dollars from District 5017. Well, so what, it was, what did they do? From art fairs to auctions, bike rides to barbecues, food festivals to 5K runs, pizza parties to pints for polio, if you like beer, and many other approaches, the Rotary Clubs of Kansas continue to work toward complete eradication of polio. I want to give you some examples. Uh, for instance, my own club, in conjunction with the Shawnee Mission Club, is holding a Pints for Polio event at one of our local microbreweries. The Kansas City, Kansas Club is conducting a Halloween costume contest on the 30th to raise money. Gardner is having a wine and cheese social. The Lenexa Art Fair, which is a big deal every year, is planning to contribute part of their funds to polio plus. The Taste of Shawnee Street Festival is always a big fundraiser. In DeSoto, Marianne mentioned, and we talked a little bit about some friends that up there at the uh, DeSoto Club. Ruth Zimmerman passed away recently, and that club elected for this year to make memorial donations in her name and raised over $2,000 already. <coughs> the, the Village West Club this year held what was called Strikeout Polo, where it's a particular game. People attended that uh, ball game, got an opportunity, some of my folks were there, and Marianne and I got to throw out the first pitch of that game, which is a fun thing to do. And one club that you're going to be really interested in, the Topeka South Club. You should go out there on the 27th, every year, the great pumpkin run raises an amazing amount of money for Polo Plus. Those clubs and many others throughout the Rotary Districts of Kansas and the Rotary meetings around the world, we frequently close those meetings with a thing that Bill Gates likes to do. At those meetings, he asks everybody to raise one hand. Everybody hold up one hand, just like this. And what happens is that when I say we are, you're going to say this close. So here we go. We are this close. Oh, you can do it better than that. We are this close. Thank you so much, Jim Barnett, our chairman of the Polio Plus and our, amb our ambassador. We have a proclamation to celebrate our day, and this proclamation is um, uh, by the governor, state of Kansas, whereas Rotary International oh, oh God, uh, <laughs> started on October 24th, 1984. And so we, would, we have this uh, uh, World Polio Day Proclamation signed by Governor Jeff Collier. And I would like to present this proclamation to Jim and Mary Ann Barnett.
it's very fitting that the state of Kansas realized how important and Polio Plus has become. We want to send our thank you to the governor for uh, arranging for this proclamation. On behalf of the, all of the Rotary Clubs of the state of Kansas, we are very happy to accept this proclamation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. We're pleased today that we have two polio survivors here to share their stories to help us gain a better perspective of the impact that polio has on its victims. First, we'll hear from Mary Ann Arnett, who has become a familiar face in District 5710 in club meetings, as she has joined Jim in bringing the Polio Plus story to our members and she has shared her polio experience. Please welcome Mary Ann Arnett first, and then after Mary Ann, we'll hear from Janelle Karkoff. And uh, in regard to her introduction, in October 2017, our next polio survivor after Mary Ann participated in a series of meetings of the downtown Topeka Rotary, telling the stories of members uh, and family affected by polio that led to the club raising an amazing $20,000 for Polio Plus. And so after we hear from Mary Ann to tell us her story, then we'll have the opportunity to hear from Janelle Parkiff and um, we're, we're very pleased that she's willing to share her story with us today. And so after Marianne, we'll hear from Janelle Parker. because this is my 81st birthday. <laughs> and Kansas has always been very special to me because while I was a, a youngster, I was in the Ozarks most of the time near Osceola, Missouri, but uh, we moved to Kansas City during uh, uh, the war and I, uh, was in school in Kansas City for second and third grade. And then in July of 1946, I woke up one morning, just like you're seeing now on television with this thing, the polio look-alike, where people, the children are getting out of bed and I just collapsed to the floor with no strength. And so after uh, I was diagnosed with polio, my mother had read in Life magazine about the Sister Kenny treatment, and there was only one hospital within five, 500 miles of Osceola, Missouri, that did have the Sister Kenny treatment. So I was brought up to Bethany Hospital, which is now Providence Hospital, and I spent eight months there, and that sounds like a lot, but I have to tell you, I had great roommates, we just real devils. In fact, Jim mentioned uh, Ruth Scott Zimmerman, whose husband is a Rotarian in DeSoto, Kansas. Uh, she was my roommate, and we were racing around the halls in old-fashioned wheelchairs, but we could really drive all the other patients in Bethany crazy. But anyway, that's why there I was in Kansas, and then after I uh, left Bethany Hospital, and went back home. We lived then in Kansas City, had to find a school to go to, and there was a school for uh, handicapped children, but my parents decided I wasn't that handicapped, so um, I was able to attend public schools. But then when it was time to go to college, that was kind of a dilemma, because I had to really worry, how do you get from one class to the other? My father wanted to get me a little Vespa, but I didn't think that was too cute. And so I, I had to look for a school that had a very small campus. And I chose a school in Nashville, Tennessee, Vanderbilt. It's a very compact inner city campus. Go there, the first day I am enrolling at Vanderbilt, I meet this guy right here, <laughs> who is from Lebanon, Tennessee, right outside of Nashville. 
and that's the best thing that ever happened to me, and it would never have happened if I had not had polio. <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> so, um, and though after uh, graduation, um, I traveled around the United States with Jim wherever he was working, but uh, when it was time for him to retire, we decided because Kansas City is the center of the United States, and I certainly had some relatives in uh, the Ozarks and in Kansas City, and so Jim decided in 1990 to uh, retire to Beewood, Kansas. And one of the very first things he did was start going to the Rotary Club, which has just been a wonderful experience for him and for me too, because really the things that Rotary has done for polio it's just phenomenal. It really is. And so, but here I am, back in Kansas today, but I, I don't even know if I ever got to the state capitol here when I was a kid because I didn't take a lot of the school tours, but I sure was at Bethany Hospital. So I have a real affinity for Kansas, and I'm so happy that you asked me to come today to share my story. Thank you very much. Janelle Carcass, it's your turn. <laughs> my name is Janelle Carcass, and I'm a polio survivor. When I was two years old, my family lived on a farm in Missouri, just uh, southwest of Sedalia. I was born in Sedalia. And I started getting sick, and my mother, after two or three days, could not break my fever. And so she took me into Windsor, Missouri. I don't know if you know where these towns are. But, um, and we saw Dr. Thurber, who I remember very well. I don't remember a lot of what happened to me. I've read my doctor's reports, and my mother told me my story, my God story, is what she would say, and um, how God saved me. And, but I do remember Dr. Thurber. He had a lot of black hair, and I was very mesmerized by that. <laughs> and uh, so um, I... <coughs> He took one look at me and said, I think she's got polio. I think you need to take her to Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City as soon as possible. A few years ago, I went uh, and got my records from them. And uh, sure enough, there they were, his, his telegram, <coughs> something like a telegram, that he had sent to Children's Mercy Hospital. Please accept this child. Um, I'm sure that she has polio and needs to be seen. Um, I was there for... Um, eight days, 18 days, excuse me, and they, when I got there, uh, the nurse came out to get me and, and all that, and then my parents, they said, I'm sorry, but you'll have to go home. And so for the whole time I was at Children's Mercy, they didn't see me, and I'm sure they talked with Dr. Thurber, but, you know, that would be hard for any parent to leave their two-year-old, and uh, I have put up, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't remember any of it, I guess I had fun. I usually do, so I usually choose to have fun. And, um, but anyway, so when I came to, when they came to get me, to take me home, I didn't know them. I wasn't going to go with those people, who are you? And so anyway, finally they, uh, you know, some probably gave me candy or something that would usually do it. And uh, I went, but I, uh, after that, I went to see Dr. Thurber weekly for quite a while. And then, of course, my brother and my sister, I have an older brother and an older sister, and they had to get the polio shots early. This was before they really started giving out polio shots to children. And uh, all I remember, besides Dr. Thurber, is sitting on the floor in the examining room, and my sister didn't seem to, to bother, it didn't bother her to get the shot, but my brother, I mean, it took two nurses, and my mom, and another person, I don't know where she came from, and to hold him down, because he was, there was, it wasn't gonna be easy. But, um, so I knew Dr. Thurber for a long time, and every time we, once when we moved to Topeka, then we could still go down to Missouri because my grandparents lived down there, and we loved going to the farm and, you know, riding horses and doing all the farm stuff. And, uh, but we'd always go by and see Dr. Thurber, and it was such a pleasure. Um, do I feel blessed? Yeah, I feel blessed every day. And uh, so that's, you know, that's pretty much how I can, my talk, I mean, I can tell you a lot of hospital stuff, but, 
you know, you kind of figure out what that's all about. So I'm, I'm blessed every day, and I'm thankful for that, and I think this is a great, great thing that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Ann and Janelle, for your, your stories. We really do appreciate hearing them. And I want to ask an audience, are any of you uh, polio survivors or caregivers? Raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, Jim and Mary Ann wanted me to introduce their daughter, Mary Beth. Where are you, Mary, Mary Beth? And she came here from St. Louis. So, yeah. Thank you, Mary Beth. Um, then uh, Jim also wanted me to mention, uh, please pick up, uh, there are some posters and materials over on the table, over there. Please, please pick up that information. And he said, wear your in polio now buttons. So we, we shall be sure to do that, Jim. And so at this time, uh, we will be blessed with a song. And the song is You'll Never Walk Alone. And our songstress is Lara Brooks. She's with the Washburn University Music Department, and she's a lecturer. And so, Lara, could you please provide us with the song? Thank you. Uh, here to do whatever needs to be done. 
not here, but he's downstairs. Okay, I want to say thank you to um, Jim and Marianne for being co-chairs. They're honorary co-chairs. And, and to our speakers, thank you so much, Kathleen and Lara and Janelle. So anyway, I hope I didn't leave anybody out, and I sure do appreciate everyone coming here today. We had a good time. How about this ambiance in the Kansas State Capitol building? Thank you.